So before we begin tonight, this is just a big shout out to all my good friends over at Chilling. Yes, the new app that's the home for all things horror. Now at the moment we're giving people an opportunity to invest in this app, but time is running out very quickly. So, if you're interested, head over to the link in the description below and join the family. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. The Craigslist Job Gone Wrong by Joshua Brooks, 2018. Okay, I uh, don't really know where to start, but well, here I go. My name was Joshua. I used to live in the US, in a state I won't mention with my sister and her son. Yeah, my sister moved in with me after leaving her abusive husband. Now, what I'm about to say happened about a year and a half ago. I'm still suffering nightmares about it. I was afraid to come out and speak the truth on this story, but after much convincing from a few close friends that I felt I could truly, truly trust, I decided to share this story as a warning. And what I'm about to say is 100% true. This is no BS. This is what myself and my friend experienced. So I was back in June a year and a half ago. I've been working at a group home in my state as a social worker slash counsellor for abused kids. But then after a couple of months, myself and a few other employees there, one of them being a close friend of mine named Sam, uh, we were let go. I was devastated. Didn't know how to make ends meet. I went out looking for jobs, putting in applications, going on interviews, and so did Sam. And nothing we were doing was turning out well. So after the better part of six months, with both of us still being unemployed, I know I personally began to get really frustrated. I mean, I had a mortgage to pay, other bills to pay. Plus, I was taking care of my sister and her kid. So it was safe to say that I needed a job, and quick. And so I went searching through Craigslist. I found this one job. They were looking for people to work at their B&B. It was going to open soon. They were looking for live-in housekeepers, and cook, and front desk clerk. It was 20 bucks an hour, and it came with free room and board, thus being able to go back to our own homes on the weekend. Well, I thought, oof, I can't beat this. 20 bucks an hour? That's damn good money. I wasn't working in my career field, but at this point, I was willing to take what I could get. So that evening, I called the number that I'd seen on the Craigslist ad, and this guy with a southern accent answered. I told him I was interested in applying. He said, well, when could I come over for an interview? I told him tomorrow. He asked if I could come that very same evening. Hmm. Come that evening? It's pretty fast for an interview. Well, I thought this, and I even told the guy. Not that I was complaining, though, but I just thought it was odd, especially seeing as how it was already four in the evening, getting close to dark when I called. Anyway, the guy said that they were pretty desperate, and that if I really wanted the position... I mean, that evening would help them out. I agreed to come and asked if I could bring a friend. I was referring to Sam. The guy said, yeah, sure. Asked me what my name was, gave me the address of where to come, and said he'd see us when we got there. So I told my sister and my nephew, who was 15 at the time, that I was going to this job I'd found on Craigslist. And as I ignored my sister and my nephew's rantings about how I should be careful about what I respond to on Craigslist, I left the house, went to pick up Sam, we went on our way to the job interview. As we were driving, I got annoyed listening to Sam's constant rantings about this $20 an hour job being too good to be true. I didn't care if it was too good to be true. I needed a job, and I was desperate. So I was going to believe it was true no matter what. I couldn't believe how far out it was from the main city, though. I mean, for the better part of an hour, the ride consisted of me driving down a long stretch of rural road with nothing but woods on both sides. When Sam and I finally got there, though, the B&B was sitting back up off the road and looked like one of those plantation houses you'd see in Louisiana. When we walked up to the porch of the B&B, we were greeted by some skinny, young-faced kid who couldn't have been any older than 20, named Trent. Trent looked like someone who belonged at a skater park somewhere. He gave us this weird smile upon greeting us. We told Sam and I that we were the fourth and fifth applicants that had been interviewed today and that the other applicants who come had all been hired on the spot for the positions they wanted. Oh, I thought. 
You were being hired on the spot. Well, that was rare. Well, it took me three interviews before I was hired to be the counsellor at the group home I was working at before. Anyway, as Trent walked us into the B&B and led us into the kitchen, he turned around to face us and said, well, I think Jack will like you two. And as Sam began to speak, from out of nowhere behind us appeared this big, tall, built-ass guy. Oof, the guy was so tall he looked like he could be a replacement for the wrestler of The Undertaker. Well, Sam and I found out the guy was Jack, the owner of the B&B. After Sam introduced ourselves to him, Sam, Jack and I walked to a big ballroom area to sit and talk. I asked Jack who it was that I talked to on the phone earlier, inquiring about the job, and since I recognised by his voice that I hadn't been talking to him, Jack that is. And Jack told me I'd been talking to his brother Charlie. Jack said that Charlie has the brains behind the whole operation. Operation? I asked. You mean the opening of the B&B? Jack responded with a yes and a weird laugh before saying... Yeah, that's what I meant. Jack went on to tell us that Charlie would be around the B&B for a little while, but that mostly Charlie would be working behind the scenes, and that he, Jack, and his son Trent and his daughter Marissa would be the ones who would be running and operating the B&B from day to day, once it opened. He then told us that he, Trent and Marissa worked for Charlie, and that Charlie was an affiliated worker for a top-secret entity within the government. Well, this piqued my curiosity... I asked Jack what this entity was, but Jack wouldn't say. In fact, he changed the subject by suggesting we follow him to his office so he could interview us there. And we did. As we went to into his office, the first thing that stood out to me was how freaking creepy it was. There were bottled animals of all types on shelves and tables around the room. Pigs, spiders, even shrunken heads. You name it, Jack had it. It looked like we'd stepped into a scene from Rom Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses or something. However, I didn't give a shit too much of what he had in his office. All I wanted was a job. So as Sam and I sat at his desk, ready to be interviewed, it was at this time I noticed a very unique-looking tattoo on Jack's lower arm. It was a black tattoo of an owl, with a pyramid in the middle of the body of the owl. And in the middle of the pyramid was an all-seeing eye. I asked Jack what the tattoo meant. He said that he loved owls and the tattoo was something he got during college. Well, before I could probe him any further, he quickly changed the subject by stating his hopes that he could hire two more people so he could finally begin work on getting the B&B ready for opening. And so the interview began, with Jack asking us weird-ass questions, like how healthy we were, when was the last time we were sick, what was our eye colour, were we on any prescription medicine? And even more weirder than that, what were our blood types? And if we both were signed up as organ donors on our driver's licenses? Well, throughout all of these questions, Sam and I were like, what the hell do these questions have to do with the jobs that we have to do here at the B&B? Jack assured us, though, that the questions were 100% being legitimately asked in case any emergencies happened to us upon working at the B&B. Jack even then told us some story of a guy who had once worked for him, who was secretly on pain meds, and how one day Jack found the guy dead in the concrete mix. Well, I still found the questions to be beyond weird, though. So did Sam, and to be honest, I felt like I was ready to just to get up out of there and leave, because I was beginning to think that maybe this wasn't even a real interview, but some kind of damn scam or something. But then the desperateness of me wanting a job kicked in again, and on top of that, Jack assured us, with the seriousness once again, that the questions were being asked because he was all about safety in the workplace. So I stayed for the rest of the interview, and so did Sam. But then the interview got even weirder. Jack told us that as soon as Charlie got my name and number from earlier when I called, he and Jack had run a full background check on me. I couldn't believe it. How could he run a background check on me with just my name and number? Sam and I thought this was way beyond creepy. Jack told us that we'd be surprised what a person can find out with just a name and a telephone number. And once again, I was creeped the fuck out. What kind of employer does this even before a potential employee comes for the job interview? At this point, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I had to ask him if this was even a real interview. Well, he assured Sam and I that it was. That he had to make sure he was getting the right type of employer. Yeah, right, I thought. Still found something creepy about the entire thing. 
But I didn't want to leave because I knew I couldn't. God, I needed a job. So at this point, Jack said the interview was over. We were both hired because he liked us. Yes, I thought. I got it. I finally got a damn job. Inside my mind, I was doing backflips. So when Jack showed us around the B&B and told us that before the place opened, we'd have to pitch in and do a lot of cleaning to the place, well, it was okay. Well, he was right. With the exception of four rooms in the B&B, every other room he showed us looked like a complete freaking dump, including one room having a body chalk outline on the floor. Well, Jack explained, though, that the body chalk outline had come from a murder that occurred when the former owners owned the house. And then he took us what had to be one of the creepiest rooms in the entire place. The walls of the room were covered in blood, with a gurney sitting on one side of the room and a wheelchair sitting on the other side. Well, Jack explained the look of the room, as it was told to him by the previous owners. A group of guys were staying in the house while attending a rodeo in town. One of the guys cut himself and smeared blood all over the walls. Jesus fucking Christ, I thought. That was creepy in and of itself, but Jack stating that to him the room resembled a kill room. Oh shit, that just made the entire situation even more scary in my mind. And it honestly sent chills down my damn spine. And so, after viewing the entire inside of the house, I'm thinking, that's it, we've seen this. We've been hired. We can go home now and come back on Monday, bright and early for work. Well, nope. Because Jack then takes us out to the garage and says he has one last thing to show us. The wooded nature trail. What? The wooded nature trail? At night? How the hell can he show us this trail when it's dark as shit outside? But he gives us each flashlights before he takes one for himself. Then he grabs his shotgun off a shelf. Whoa, oh, I thought. And I freaking hate shotguns. When I was eight, my dad and I were at a gas station one night. My dad was robbed at gunpoint and murdered. Ever since then, guns have just scared the shit out of me. However, Jack assured Sam and I that he was taking the gun because of the dogs that often roam the woods at night. That explanation didn't help. Not only did I not want to go out with someone toting around a gun, but I also didn't want to even go out to the freaking woods, period. Overseeing the look of annoyance on Jack's face, I decided to hide my fears and go along with the gun and the wooded nature trail after all. Well, I didn't want to lose the job that I just got hired on. So as we walked along the wooded nature trail, going deeper and deeper into the forest, Jack began to ask us what made us tick, what things we enjoyed. Sam said he enjoyed painting. I said I liked what I did as a counsellor, helping people, empowering people. As Jack and I began to converse about my last job, after a few minutes he hushed me as he said he heard climbing noises in the trees around him. I looked at Jack as if he was nuts. Yeah, of course you heard climbing noises, dumbass. I'm here in the woods. As Jack eyed a squirrel climbing up the tree, he told me to hold his flashlight while he pointed his shotgun at it. When Sam asked what the hell he was doing, Jack said he was going to shoot the squirrel. What the hell, I thought. He asked Jack why, and Jack just shot me the creepiest glare and said, You're funny. Well, as Jack was about to shoot the squirrel, he stopped, looked at me and asked, Oh, wait a minute. Where are my goddamn manners? You want to shoot it? Well, I thought this man is freaking nuts. I'm not one who hurts animals, so I immediately declined. As Jack asked Sam the same question, he declined too. But before Sam could get any other word out besides the word no, Jack had fired the shot and the squirrel was dead on the ground. The sound of the shotgun was so loud that it echoed in my ears like an explosion. As Jack laughed like a madman while trampling over and picking up the dead squirrel that had blood oozing out of it, and looking at it like it may have been a tasty lunch meal, I thought to myself, man, this guy is freaking weird. But I also thought, don't care if he's weird or not. As long as I had a job, that's all that mattered. So after killing the squirrel, and after Jack told us he was going to add the squirrel to his collection of dead animals in the office, we proceeded to walk away from the wooded nature trail, back to the B&B and back to my car. As finally, the weirdest job interview ever was appearing to be over. Well, the 
weirdness didn't stop on our way back to my car. Though. As we were walking, Jack asked me to hold his dead, bleeding squirrel because he claimed he couldn't hold his gun and the squirrel at the same time. He didn't ask Sam to hold it. He asked me. God, I didn't want to hold it. The thing looked disgusting as hell. Dead and bloodied. But because I wanted to keep my current job stated as hired, I reluctantly agreed to hold it while we walked back to my car. I held it by the end of its tail, at arm's length. I tried to hold back my urge to vomit out of sickness for what was dangling in front of my eyes. As we walked back to my car, I was mentally thanking the guards that the interview was over. I mean, I was thrilled to finally have a job, but boy, was that one creepy damn job interview. Anyway, as Jack told us to be back at the B&B bright and early on Monday morning, 8am to be exact, I gave Jack back his dead and bloody squirrel. Happily, Sam and I got in my car and drove away. Part 2 so that weekend, I packed as much as I thought I'd need for the week at the B&B, and when Monday came, I hugged my sister and my nephew goodbye and headed for the job. Sam drove to the B&B in his own car, and I met up with him that morning when we arrived. It was at this time that I also met the other two employees. Katrina, well, I won't give her last name out of respect for her family, and Rob, I won't give his name either for the same reason. We also met Jack's daughter, Marissa, who looked to be a cracked-out 80s version of Ali Sheedy, just with longer, shaggier hair. We also met Charlie. Charlie looked like one creepy fucker with his dark brown, slick-back hair, his cold, black eyes. Uh, he was a bit short, but built in the chest. His face looked hard, like he didn't take shit from anyone. Anyway, after Jack introduced us all to each other, Jack informed us that there was no need for us to try and use our cell phones because we wouldn't get any cell phone service where we were, and the phone and internet service in the B&B hadn't been installed yet. So other than our cars, we had no other way to contact anyone in town. Well, that should have been a red flag in my mind, but it wasn't, because to me it made sense. The B&B was in a rural area, so of course our cell phones wouldn't work up there. Anyway, after Jack explained all that, we got to work. Katrina began working in the kitchen, cleaning it and performing a cooking test for Trent. I worked on cleaning up the backyard, which included a backyard shed, and I also helped brainstorm some ideas with Charlie as for advertising. Charlie put Sam to work cleaning the bedrooms and bathrooms, and this was something Sam said scared the hell out of him, as one of the rooms he went in had snakes slithering out of every corner of the wall. Sam said as he saw the snakes slithering towards him, he ran out of the room and into the hallway where he bumped into Jack. Sam said when he told Jack what he'd seen in the room, Jack just laughed and said, Ah, you found the snake room, huh? Sam told Jack that he needed an exterminator to get on that problem really quick. And Jack just laughed and said Trent was on it before walking away. Sam even told me that Katrina told him that while she was working with Trent in the kitchen that day, Trent said something that made her very creeped out. Katrina stated that Trent had said that, judging from her ethnicity, he had bet that she'd had a lot of melanin within her. Uh, when Sam told me that, I thought that was beyond weird. But that wasn't all. Katrina told Sam that Trent then went on to say that how much melanin went for 400 bucks on the black market, and that people were killed just to get that shit. Sam said Katrina told him that, and that scared the shit out of her, and at that moment she didn't know what to say, so she just nodded and said, Uh-huh. Rushed the hell out of the kitchen. And yeah, as I heard Sam tell me all of that, it scared the hell out of me too. Who has a conversation like that with someone? Later that evening, after we'd finished doing day one of the cleanup work, getting the B&B ready for opening, we all, that's myself, Sam, Trent, Marissa, Charlie, Katrina, and Rob, sat around a dinner table for dinner. It was a meal that Katrina had cooked earlier for evening during her cooking test. It was during the dinner that Rob told us that right before dinner, he'd been chased through the wooded nature trail by dogs that belonged to Jack. This too should have been a red flag in my mind, but it wasn't. This did, though, scare the hell out of me, particularly because I have a morbid fear of dogs. Ever since I was ten, I've been scared of dogs, specifically the big ones. Jack explained away the incident as just being one that had happened by accident, 
that the dogs were harmless, but I did nothing to quell Rob's anger over the incident. As everyone talked about how their first day had gone, Jack began to tell us what was in store for us tomorrow. A spirit cooking ritual. What? I asked him. What the hell was a spirit cooking ritual? Sam and I had both asked him this, and Charlie just gave us the weirdest answer of how it was hard to explain that we'd just have to wait until tomorrow to see what it was for ourselves. I would have been fine with that answer. I think Sam would have too, had we not seen Charlie smile and wink at us immediately after stating his answer. Again, this should have been another red flag for me, but unfortunately it wasn't. And so after dinner, we settled in for the night, went to sleep in the only four rooms that looked decent and had furniture in them. And then at one in the morning, Trent yelled for us to come downstairs because Jack needed all of us out in the wooded nature trail with him ASAP. What? I thought. One in the morning? What for? Trent said it was because inspection people were coming first thing in the morning, so we needed to help Jack pretty up the wooded nature trail tonight, while he and Marissa and Charlie cleaned up the inside and the rest of the outside areas of the B&B. Well, I thought, okay, but this couldn't be done at four or five, maybe even six in the morning. This had to be done at one in the morning. Damn it. I don't know why this wasn't sending off red flags in my head at the time. It should have, I guess, but I was being so damn naive and gullible to believe shit that now, looking back, made absolutely no freaking sense at all. So, with flashlights, given to us by Trent, in hand, Sam, Katrina, Rob and I walked out towards the wooded trail. The first thing we noticed was that our cars were gone from the garage area. That was weird to us because that's where we parked our cars when we came to the B&B on the first day. So, who'd moved our cars? Katrina stated how she thought maybe the cars had been moved out so they could clean the garage area. Because this area did have a funky type of smell to it. Rob and Sam and I, we went along with that idea. Yeah, maybe that's why our cars were moved. God, we were so freaking stupid. Anyway, after walking for the better part of five minutes on the trail, we heard footsteps a few feet away from us. As we turned to our left, we saw several feet away was Charlie in full army fatigue, from the black and green war paint on his face to the army hat on his head down to his big black combat boots. On Charlie's left hand was a long butcher knife. He was standing there, just staring at us like a homicidal lunatic. At that moment, my blood ran cold. I couldn't understand it. Sam couldn't understand it, and Katrina didn't understand it, and neither could Rob. Why the hell was he standing there with a knife in his hand, basically looking at us like that? Before we had time to even think any further, we heard growling from behind us. As we all turned around, we saw three big black Rottweiler dogs standing a few feet from us, with long, sharp white teeth, but were showing slight drool dripping from their mouths. And that was when we began to panic. As the dogs instantly began charging towards us, Rob shouted for us to run, and run we most certainly freaking did. As we ran, I looked back at the dogs and saw that another dog had joined the three that were already chasing us. This just made me pick up the pace in my running, and I told the others to do the same. However, it seemed the more we ran, the further away from the B&B we seemed to be. But as Rob, Sam and I ran back up to the porch of the B&B, we didn't even realise that Katrina wasn't with us. We'd really had no time to think of anything because we'd rushed through the doorway of the house as one of the dogs jumped onto the porch, grabbed hold of Rob's leg, and yanked him down onto the floor. As Rob yelled for us to help him, Sam and I grabbed hold of Rob's arm and tried our very best to pull him towards us, towards the inside of the house, away from the dog that was biting down on his leg. As blood spurted down of Rob's leg, and as I looked up and saw the other three dogs speedily making their way towards the porch, I knew we were running out of time. We had to get Rob free from the dog's clenches quick. Sam and I pulled even harder to try to get Rob's leg free. As the other three dogs rushed onto the porch, that was when Sam and I finally were able to pull Rob free from that dog. And just as all four dogs reached the door, 
we slammed it shut just in time. However, the horror wasn't over there. As the three of us remained in the hallway of the B&B. Before we could even collect our thoughts mentally, a loud shotgun blast was heard from outside, making all of us jump. The blast made a huge hole through the front door. Jeez, what the fuck was going on, I thought to myself. And at that moment, we heard Jack's voice from outside. Welcome to the beginning of the spirit cooking ritual, Jack yelled. What? What the fuck was he talking about? What was going on here? Is this some sort of freaking game or something? And then Rob figured it out. Yep, he's trying to freaking kill us. And at that moment, in a brief split of a minute, it all made sense. The weird questions Jack asked us during the interview, the bloody kill room Jack had showed us, the wooded nature trail tour Jack gave Sam and I during the interview, where he killed the squirrel right in front of us. The mention of the spirit cooking ritual during dinner that previous evening. Yeah, finally all made perfect freaking sense. We'd been lured into a scam. A deadly scam where we were going to be the victims of a frightening freaking murder that would be carried out by a group of crazies. I began to panic. I didn't have much time to panic as Rob, Sam and I heard Trent's voice behind us in the hallway. As we turned around, we saw Trent standing a few feet from us with a shotgun aimed directly at Rob's head. Before any of us could say a word, Trent fired the gun, blowing half of Rob's head off and sending blood splashing all over Sam and I. God, I can't even think about this without crying. So there Sam and I were, standing there in shock as Rob's dead body dropped to the floor. And Trent laughed like a homicidal maniac. And the fact that Trent then said, Oh shit, that felt good. God damn, I love killing. It's turned my blood cold. I was beyond terrified at that moment. What the fuck? These people are mental cases. And I kept thinking that maybe this is just a dream. Maybe this wasn't happening, but no. This was happening. This was real. As I stood there, shocked and stunned in my fear, Sam grabbed my arm and pulled me up the stairs of the B&B. Why he didn't run me out of the B&B, I didn't understand at the time, but I do now. I mean, where would we have run once we were outside? Our cars had been taken out of the garage to God knows where, and the B&B was in the middle of nowhere. From what we knew, Jack was still outside, so where were we going to run to? So, as Sam ran with me up the stairs, by it being darker on the upper floor, we couldn't see which rooms were which. Sam tried flipping on the hallway light as we got to the upper floor, but the lights weren't working. So we just ran into the first room we found. That happened to be the kill room. As we ran in and Sam closed the door behind us, we saw the room was lit by red light bulbs that were nailed to the ceiling. Sam ran over to the windows and began to try pull them open, but it was no use. Either Jack, Marissa, Trent, or Charlie had nailed the windows shut from the outside. I didn't stop Sam from trying to pry open the windows, though. Meanwhile, my mind was stuck on what I'd just seen downstairs. A murder. A horrifying murder right in front of my eyes. The blood of someone else was splashed all over me, all over my skin. As I looked up, I then saw something that heightened my fear. A few feet away was a gurney, and on that gurney was a dead body. I couldn't tell if it was a male or female body, but the eyes on the body had been removed, and the chest had been slit wide open. All of the organs inside the body had been removed, and blood was smeared all over the outside of the body's chest. God, it was horrifying. I just kept thinking, God, is this what they're going to do to us? As I called Sam over for him to see what I was seeing, we both stared shocked and horrified. But then at that moment, we heard Trent's voice yelling. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. Oh, this guy is totally insane. 
Without a second thought, Sam grabbed my arm and pulled me over into a closet to hide, with Sam slamming the door to the closet behind her. It wasn't even a minute after we were in the closet that we saw Charlie dragging a kicking and fighting Katrina into the room, with Jack following behind. God damn it, I wanted to rush out of that closet to help Katrina. But Sam said no. In fact, Sam covered my mouth to keep me from even making a damn sound. In that closet, I saw the second most frightening sight of my entire life. I saw Charlie stabbing Katrina over and over and over as she fought and screamed for her life. And as blood splashed everywhere, he just kept stabbing her in the face until she was dead. All I could do in that closet while watching all of this was cry. Cry and wish in my mind that I could help her. That Sam and I could both help her. But we knew we couldn't. If we rushed out of that closet to help Katrina, Charlie and Jack would kill us both. So all we could do was watch another life get taken right in front of our damn eyes. After what had to be about the tenth or eleventh stab, we saw Charlie quit the repeated process and then look at Jack with a smile. We heard Charlie say how he was going to drop off the two, now realizing he meant robbing Katrina. We then heard Charlie say how he was going to drop off these two, realizing he meant robbing Katrina, and come back to the B&B after Jack, Trent, and Marissa had finished Sam and I off. God, we've got to get out of here, I thought. Then we saw Charlie drag Katrina out of the room with Jack following behind. I finally broke into sobs. I couldn't believe what had transpired in just a matter of minutes. The horror I'd seen. As Sam got up from the floor and tried to pull me up, I was too emotional to even stand. I was too traumatized at that point. I was too traumatized at that point. Not before even a moment could go past from Katrina's murder, all of a sudden I found myself being yanked through the wall in the closet and into another room. Sam yelled out for me and tried to grab me, but couldn't get there in time. As I yelled and fought to keep myself from being dragged along, I was suddenly tossed across the floor of another room. The snake room, which, like the kill room, was also lit by red light bulbs that were nailed to the ceiling. I knew I was in the snake room because within seconds, as I got to my feet, I could see the snakes slithering out from every corner of the wall. The one thing I'm scared of more than dogs is snakes. I was terrified. I rushed to where I thought the door of the room would be, but I couldn't find it. It was as if the door to the room didn't exist. God, how the hell am I going to get out of here? I thought to myself. I began yelling and pounding on the door for help, for Sam, but it didn't make a difference. No one came for me, so I did the only thing I could think of to do move as far away from the snakes slithering towards me as possible. Well, it wouldn't help much, but what else was I going to do? Out of pure fear, I broke into sobs. Call it whatever, but I was scared. Scared out of my mind. As I was backing up, someone grabbed me from behind and yanked me out of the room. As I was kicking and fighting to get free from the person dragging me down the hallway, I looked up and saw it was Jack. I was going to die. This was it. He was going to freaking kill me. I was going to die. Part 3 As he dragged me down to the basement, to a closed door that read, Operating Room, on it, I fought even harder. I knew I had to do something, anything to prevent me from going to the other side of this door. However, all my fighting was in vain. Jack was much bigger and more built than I was. Couldn't get free from him. As he opened the door and dragged me inside the room behind it, he took me over to a gurney in the center of the room. As he picked me up and threw me onto the gurney, I felt a large pain shoot through my back. But I was sure he'd broken my back the way he'd slammed me down on that gurney. This is when my fear turned into anger anger and determination as I took my feet and kicked him hard in the nuts and I kicked him with such force that he fell down to the floor on his ass. That moment I jumped up off the gurney and ran towards the steps of the basement 
Not before Jack grabbed me by the back of my legs and tripped me up. Oh, shit, I thought. Then, as I fell to the floor, Jack jumped up and grabbed a hatchet sitting on the shelf next to him. When I saw that hatchet in his hand, I knew I had to either fight back or die in that moment. Then, Jack swung the hatchet down, aiming for my legs, but I managed to roll away just at the right time. As I got to my feet, he grabbed me by the neck from behind and slammed me up against the wall in front of him. He held me against the wall by squeezing his hands tightly around my neck. I thought right then that that was the end of me. I was going to die. I began seeing blurriness. My mind at that moment went back to the very moment I'd caught about this job, and I began mentally wishing I'd never called in the first place. I was about to give up, but I didn't because I knew I wasn't ready to die at that moment. I wasn't ready to die. I reached my arm over as far as I could, managed to grab a pair of scissors hanging on a nail from the wall. I took the scissors and stabbed them damn hard into his arm. He yelled and let go of my neck then, and I dropped to the floor almost like a freaking ragdoll. Throughout all my coughing and gagging to breathe after almost being choked to death, I managed to crawl away on the floor before getting to my feet and running to the other side of the room, where I grabbed a pistol sitting on the shelf. As Jack rushed over to me, he stopped in his tracks when he saw me aiming the pistol at him. I couldn't believe it. At that moment, the very thing I was afraid of and didn't want to have anything to do with was the thing I was holding in my hand, and I was about to use it to kill someone who was trying to kill me. I couldn't have been more terrified. So there Jack stood, just a few feet from me, smiling like a lunatic. What are you going to do? He said to me. Shoot me. You hate guns, remember? In fact, didn't you say the guns scare you? No. Don't be a fucking moron. I will, I replied. I'll kill you after you murdered Katrina and Rob. He then laughed at me, said I didn't have the balls to shoot him took a few steps towards me, my heart beginning to swell with fear. Oh, and I did not want to fire that gun, because he was indeed right. Guns did scare the shit out of me. But as he rushed towards me, and tackled me down to the floor, I realized I had no choice. Well, it was hard for me to even pull the trigger. And he had his hands wrapped around the gun now, trying to pry it from my hands. As we fought and tussled on the floor for the gun... Somehow, I believe now out of pure luck, I managed to pull the trigger, not once but three times, firing into his chest. As his eyes widened and blood spilled from his mouth, he dropped down dead on top of me. Oh, I was almost sick, and in that moment I went into a brief mental breakdown. But somehow through this, I managed to push him off of me and got to my feet. But as I stood there, I stared down at my body, hands trembling, stunned in shock. I was seconds, just mere seconds away from mentally cracking up, because I had never killed anyone before. However, it was hearing Sam's yelling voice from the outside that shook me out of this moment. I looked around the room for what I could use to help Sam, as I certainly wasn't going to use that freaking gun again. So I grabbed a baseball bat sitting on the shelf, and ran up the stairs to Sam's aid. As I ran outside, I followed Sam's yells. I saw Trent on top of him, a few feet away from the porch of the B&B, choking the life out of Sam. Anger erupted within me again, and I ran over and smashed Trent in the back of his head with the bat. As I dropped the bat and sat down beside Sam, he leapt into his feet after asking if he was all right. While well, he was coughing with severity, he said he felt weak and lightheaded. As I looked up, I counted it as a miracle that Marissa's truck was in the driveway. It hadn't been there when Sam, Rob, and I had run back into the B&B before. I hurriedly helped Sam over to the truck, got him inside, and cursed in anger when the keys weren't in the ignition. 
And it was at this moment that Sam told me that the keys were on Marissa, whom Sam had killed in the hallway of the B&B before being attacked by Trent. So I left Sam inside the truck, told him I'd be right back, and rushed back in for Marissa's keys. I didn't even realise that Trent was no longer lying on the ground in front of the B&B. So as I rushed inside, from out of nowhere, Trent jumped on my back like some kind of spider monkey or something, and began biting me and tearing at the skin on my neck and lower face. It was at this moment that Trent and I became embroiled in a fight. I struggled to get him off me, but once I did, we began exchanging blows, and our fight rolled over into the dining room, where we were knocking over tables and everything. The fight was brutal. And he was strong, stronger than I'd thought. As the fight continued, somehow Trent got on top of me and began choking me. God, what was it with this guy and choking people? I fought as hard as I could to get his hands off my neck, but I just couldn't. And this kid was strong. I was so close to blocking out then, when Sam rushed out from behind Trent and put him in a tight chokehold, pulling Trent off of me. As Trent and Sam now became engaged in a fight with each other, all I could do was gag and cough, trying to regain my composure after almost being choked to death. I don't remember how long the fight between the two of them lasted, but I do remember Sam eventually jumping on top of Trent and, with knife in hand, slashing Trent's throat, killing him. Sam looked at me, and as I looked at him, we sighed with relief that it was over. We'd survived, and it was all over. As we both walked out of the B&B and back to the truck, getting inside and driving away, we had no clue that it wasn't over just yet. Because hiding in the back seat of the truck was Charlie. As Sam drove with me in the front passenger seat, Charlie popped up from behind us and grabbed Sam around the neck, trying to strangle him. These people must have some obsession with strangling. As Sam almost lost control of the wheel while gagging to breathe, I told Sam to keep his hands on the wheel. I then bit down hard on Charlie's arm, making blood stream from him, making him yell out in pain while letting go of Sam. I finally had enough of all this. Anger overtook me as I jumped in the back seat and tackled Charlie down to the floor. We began fighting exchanging blows with each other, and as Charlie tried to get on top of me, trying once again to do what they obviously love to do, strangle me, I managed to take my right foot and press down on the back door handle a few feet away from me and open it. As the door swung open, I took my right foot and kicked Charlie hard in the nuts, sending him flying off me and out of the car. Then with quickness, I shot up, grabbed the door handle and slammed the car door shut. As I looked out the back, I saw Charlie stand to his feet on the road, shake his head and shoot his eyes over at the car we were driving away in, filled with rage. Jeez, he had to have been pretty strong to survive being kicked out of a moving car. Finally, though, I thought it was all over. Sam drove us straight to the police station in town, and we told two detectives everything that had happened. Told them all about Jack, Trent, Marissa and Charlie, Gave them the address of the B&B. Later, one of the detectives told us that he'd sent officers out to the address we'd given him, and that there was nothing or no one there but an empty house. No bodies of Jack, Marissa, or Trent. No spirit cooking ritual. Didn't find any snakes in the snake room. No blood or gurney or anything creepy in the kill room. In fact, the detective said that it was just an old house, an old plantation house that had been abandoned for years. I couldn't believe it. Neither could Sam. We, we know what we saw. We know what happened to us there. So what the fuck was happening now? Anyway, the detective told us the car would take Sam and I home from the station because Marissa's car that we'd driven to the station in was now being impounded. So we went home. As we were riding home, though, being in the same car together, I thought back to something the detective had told me in the interrogation room in the station. And I told Sam about it. I told Sam how, in the interrogation room, the detective had mentioned about the spirit cooking ritual. 
but I'd never even mentioned this to the detectives. For some reason, I'd forgotten all about mentioning it. I asked Sam if he'd mentioned the spirit cooking ritual to either of the detectives. Sam swore that he didn't. He didn't even think of mentioning it, because he was more focused on describing the murders of Rob and Katrina that he'd seen. So how in the fuck had that detective known? Unless he and the other detective were in on it. So once we got home, I decided to Google the detective's names. And I found online a picture that both the detectives had taken with the police chief and the rest of the police department staff. And on the bare arms of these detectives and the police chief was the same tattoo that Sam and I had seen on Trent and Jack's arms. Only the tattoos that were on the police chief and the detectives were smaller than the one Jack had on his arm. Well, that means that those two detectives and the chief of police were in on what happened. Probably the entire force was behind this. Days later, Sam and I each received a visit from two men who identified themselves as CIA agents. The agents told us that they'd gotten in contact with the police and detectives at the station that we'd gone to, and they knew about our story, what had happened to Sam and I, and that we to tell no one else of what had happened to us. Because if we did, there would be grave consequences. Well, this scared the shit out of me. I asked them why, and if they were connected to Jack, Charlie, Trent, and Marissa, but they wouldn't tell me or Sam when Sam asked. They just said that for our own safety and livelihood, to not tell anyone else what had happened to us, that they would be watching our every move. This made both of us extremely scared. It also made us believe that not only were the entire police department behind what happened to us, but that the government was behind what happened to us as well. So here I am, present day. I've changed my name. So has Sam. We've moved our families out of the state we were in. In fact, out of the US. I won't say what country we're in now, but we're in hiding for our own safety. I still don't think we're safe where we are. I mean, Sam and his family and me and my family, we've had to move six different times because each time we settled in a place, we felt like they had found us. And due to us getting constant threatening and harassing phone calls, having our homes broken into and feeling like we were being watched and followed. In the country we're in now, been here for about three months, we like to think we may be safe, but we're still unsure. We're constantly looking over our shoulders. I don't think we'll ever feel confidently safe. I can't really explain what happened, but I believe that job that we responded to was there to lure us into being the victims of some kind of government, organ harvesting, melanin theft type of thing. To this day, I suffer from nightmares. Almost every night from what I went through then. My life has never been the same and it never will be. Sam has turned to alcohol to cope with what happened, and that in turn affected his life so much that he and his wife divorced. I wanted to come here, though, as I said, to warn people, and Sam and I are working with some of our friends to try to get this story out to people on a wider scale, because all of them, Trent, Marissa, and Jack are dead, but well, Charlie is still alive, and he's still out there somewhere. And who's to say Charlie won't recruit new people? to do the same kind of job scam again to someone else. And so, I'm warning people. Be very careful about what jobs you take and respond to on Craigslist. Because if this could happen to me and my friend Sam and to the other employees who responded to that job, it can happen to you. Find out if the job you're responding to and applying to is real. If it does look too good to be true, probably is. Oh, and if the job is in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone service, don't take the job. There's something wrong there. So yes, I just wanted to warn people. I feel better knowing I did, but what happened to me will be with me for the rest of my life. Haunting me. Terrifying me. But hopefully if you follow my advice, the same terrifying event that happened to me won't happen to you.
Buckle up, boys and girls. My buddy and I just experienced some grade A creepy shit while on a trip to Red Rocks in Colorado. I wrote a lot of things down anyway, and so I figured I might as well post this story here and see what you guys think. So, who here has used Airbnb? <laughs> Raise his hand. I think I've used it no less than 20 times. All great experience up until this point. Seriously. Well, I need to go ahead and preface this by saying that, while I could send you a link to this house, it wouldn't do any good, because it's not there anymore. But we'll get to that later. I'm guessing since you're reading this, you're probably a bit like me. A big reader, kind of weird, generally a fan of being scared. More power to you. My buddy, we'll call him John, is the same way. So, a few weeks ago, John and I saw that one of our favorite bands was going to be playing at Red Rocks. We've been talking about making a trip up there for years now. We live in Florida. And the timing seemed perfect. Both of our wives are pregnant. And the thought process was that if we're going to make a trip like this, it was now or never. The drive was going to take about 24 hours. So we decided we would drive until about midnight after we got off work, find a place to crash, and finish the drive the next day. I immediately hopped onto Airbnb and started looking for somewhere cool to stay. Now, oh, remember what I said earlier about being into the slightly creepy? Well, I'm scrolling through potential places to see in Tennessee, since it's about eight hours from Tampa, where we live. I come across this majestic, plantation-style house in some place called Sequatchie, Tennessee. The pictures look amazing, and it only costs $30 a night to stay there. <laughs> $30 gets you the upstairs suite, complete with its own bathroom. You can tell that it sits on a tall hill in the woods, overlooking a fairly large valley. It's a sprawling, two-story house. White wood with ferns hanging off the wraparound porch. It looks like something from To Kill a Mockingbird. And I'm immediately sending John screenshots like, Dude, we have got to stay here. He texts back, equally enthused. He does point out, however, that the place has no review. Now, in my book, this is an Airbnb no-no. But the place seems cool, and it's so cheap and... Well, what can I say? I was feeling spontaneous. So, I booked it. Strict cancellation policy be damned. I mean, you can't beat $15 per person. <laughs> we would play rock, paper, scissors to see who got the bed when we got there. A couple of weeks go by and the day of our trip finally arrives. We both get off work at four and meet up, already packed and ready to go. We knew that the trip from Tampa to Sequatchie would take about eight hours, so we didn't waste any time getting on the interstate. Honestly, the drive up there was pretty uneventful, so I'll spare you the details. By the time we make it into Tennessee, it's approaching midnight. When we get off the interstate and head towards the address, it's dark. It doesn't get this dark in Tampa. Apparently the town of Sequatchie isn't overly concerned with things like streetlights. The cell service finally dwindled to nothing, about 15 minutes after getting off the interstate. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But John was smart enough to get a screenshot of the route beforehand, so it wouldn't be lost. <laughs> Five-star wingman there, ladies and gentlemen. We navigate some serious back roads, eventually leaving the pavement behind for a long, gravel driveway. It didn't stick out at the time, as much as it does in retrospect, but the mailbox was actually lying on the ground, causing us to miss the turn on the first pass. Only after getting out in the pitch darkness, and examining the fading address stickers by the light of John's phone, did we determine that we were indeed on the right track. 
We continue up the driveway, if not with a little more scepticism than before. It winds on for, I shit you not, twelve minutes through some mountainous territory. At times the grade became serious enough that I thought I might have to put my forerunner into four-wheel drive. We finally come around a bend in the drive that opens up onto a large field. In the distance, I see the house briefly as my high beams swing across it during the turn. I think that was the first time that I really became concerned that something wasn't right. In the brief seconds that my headlights illuminated the house, it was obvious that the pictures had been deceiving. It was without a doubt the same house, but it clearly hadn't been cared for in some time. Half of the shutters were hanging off haphazardly. The white paint was dirty and chipping. The ferns from the picture had long since withered away. My car continues the turn, and the house is once again obscured by darkness, as we make our way around the perimeter of the field in front of it. I remember John saying something along the lines of, What the fuck have you gotten us into? as we pulled to a stop in front of a massive old willow tree that served as the end of the driveway. It looked like some ancient sentinel in the semi-darkness. The house stands about thirty yards away from the end of the drive. I notice, with relief, that it does have electricity. At the side door there's one of those old-fashioned yellow light bulbs casting a sickish glow onto the surrounding bushes and the sidewalk leading to the driveway. I turn off the car and try to lighten the mood by saying something my grandfather always used to say. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. John casts me a sideways glance and smirks. <laughs> we could leave, find a Motel 6, or just take turns driving. At this point, my creep meter was quietly pinging at around six out of ten. Just on the threshold of uncomfortable, but not quite there yet. Definitely not Motel 6 uncomfortable. Oh, come on, John. Where's your sense of adventure? I say as I swing my door open and hop out. My feet make a scrunch sound as they meet the gravel, and I'm immediately struck by how loud the sound of the summer bugs is. We grab our backpacks and pillows and make our way down a very old sidewalk toward that yellow light. For some reason, it reminds me of a hospital. The instruction said check in whenever. The key will be under the mat. John stoops and lifts a corner of the ancient mat. Underneath is a skeleton key, roughly the length of my hand. Pretty cool. He stands up with it, and we just sort of stare at each other for a second. The door has a large, frosted window, and we can see that it's pitch black inside. He shakes his head at me and sticks the key in the lock. The deadbolt makes an ungodfully loud ka-chunk sound that, I swear, echoes. I reach past John and push the door inward. The air that blows out as the door opens is stale. It smells like air that has been sitting still since the Paleozoic era. Now, I need to be clear that it doesn't stink. It's just thick with the smell of disuse, if that makes sense. John gestures for me to go first, so I do. If I'm being honest, I think at this point my creep meter had probably edged up to a seven. Still quiet, but now a more pronounced pulse. Still not a Motel 6 uncomfortable, but the place just felt so empty. I shine my cell phone light around in front of me as John follows me through the door. We are in a large kitchen, huge even. He gently eases the door shut. Every footstep sounds like a squeaky explosion on the weathered hardwood, and John shushes me as I make my way towards the counter on the other side of the room. 
I can see a piece of printer paper illuminated there. My stomach drops as I get closer. Now, you're going to think I'm making this up, but I swear to God. It's a piece of printer paper with the words, Make yourself at home, scrawled on it in blue crayon. And it looks like it was written by a toddler. Each letter is blocky, crooked, and two inches tall. I turn and look at John as he begins to read it over my shoulder. And I immediately recognize his nope the fuck out of here expression. His eyes are huge. Dude, what the fuck? Dude, what the fuck? He's looking over my shoulder now. I snap my head around in the direction of his gaze. What? What is it? He's looking out of a huge window. Through it, the tree line is dimly illuminated in the hazy yellow glow from the bulb outside the door. I just saw something moving out there. I swear, just past the edge of the woods. I strain my eyes, but see only the trees and their shifting shadows. It seems like the wind is picking up. If the crayon hadn't done it, John's outburst had. I was officially Motel 6 uncomfortable. Oh, let's get out of here. You're right, we can find another place to stay. Sleeping in the car would be better than this. John is a hundred percent on board. We make our way out of the kitchen and let the door slam. No longer worrying about being quiet. I'm actually jogging by the time we get halfway down the sidewalk, my backpack bouncing awkwardly. John beats me back to the car, and I see his shoulders slump as he slows down. What? I ask, and then I see. The tires. All four tires are completely flat. That's when the screaming started. Martin! Martin! Company's here! John and I were both frozen in place. Our eyes locked together. We had both been so transfixed by the discovery of the flat tires that the sound of this woman's frantic shouts had put us into a kind of terrified stupor. Martin! My stomach felt like a twisted knot. John was facing away from the house, and over his shoulder I could see what appeared to be an old woman in a white nightshirt. She was barefoot and pacing along the edge of the woods near where we had just come from, barely visible in the edge of the dim yellow light. My eyes widened as she leaned towards the trees, and raised her hands to her mouth. Martin! Martin, it's time! John found his voice. Shit, shit, shit. Sean, what's she doing? What is she doing out here in the middle of the night? Shh. We need to be quiet. We had both ducked behind the car but I doubted that she'd be able to see us out here in the darkness anyway. I peeped over the hood toward the sounds. She was walking rapidly back and forth, slightly hunched over, staring into the dark trees. We must have run right by her on our way back to the car without even noticing. The thought of her lurking in the shadows while we hurried out of the house sent a chill down my spine. Just as I thought this, she screamed once more, her voice cracking with the strain. She paused for just a moment, as if listening, and then disappeared into the woods. The old lady literally just ran into the dark woods. No flashlight, no shoes. 
The sound of the night insects seemed to swell in the absence of her screams. Have you ever been in an extremely high-pressure situation? The adrenaline rush really does make it feel like time slows down. In the moment of surreality, two facts push themselves to the front of my mind. Bright red and almost tangible. We had lost cell service miles before reaching the house. Driving out of here in our car was not an option. The tires weren't just low. The rims were resting on the gravel driveway. That wouldn't work. No, sir. We wouldn't get ten feet. John seemed to have reached a similar conclusion and raised a fantastic counterpoint. Hey, I bet they have a phone in there. Like a house phone. <laughs> Old people love landlines. True, but I saw one glaring issue. Yeah, I really don't want to go back inside. We don't even know that it's empty. She could be back any time. I said. I noticed a pickup truck parked near a dilapidated shed near the other side of the house. It looked ancient and rusted, but all the tires seemed to be full of air. Potential. Let's go check that truck for keys. John nodded, and I was already running, dropping my backpack as I took off. I wasn't sure who Martin was, and I wanted things to stay that way. We cleared the yard in fifteen seconds, and the house had now obscured our view of the woods where the old woman had disappeared. I jerked the handle, and it swung open with a groan. John was on the passenger side and already had his cell phone light on. Together we searched for the keys. Above the visors, in the cup holders, every nook and cranny. We found nothing. As neither of us knew how to hotwire a car, we needed a new plan. Okay, I said. I vote we run for it. John opened his mouth to protest, and I talked louder. You saw that lady. She's completely batshit. She slashed our fucking tires, and now she's running to get help. She could come back any time. I know, I know, John said. But you have to remember, we basically drove up a mountain to get here. And I don't remember seeing a single car after we got off the interstate. It could be hours before we find somebody, and that nut job could just run us down in a truck. Hmm, a good point. The prospect of wandering in the dark for hours loomed ominously. So, I relented. Fine, but we have to go now if we're going. And then we were running again, aiming for that sickish yellow glow near the kitchen door, the air rushing past my ears. As we got closer, I could see the spot where the woman had run into the trees. Nothing there but darkness now. Despite our rush, we paused for a moment outside the door to peer through the frosted glass. Still pitch black dark. I took a deep breath and pushed the door in, and again we were met with the smell of air that had been sitting still for ages. The kitchen seemed to yawn backwards into deeper darkness, and my cell phone light swept over the countertops in search of a phone or a cord. John checked the other side, and we met near the back wall. Nothing, I whispered. John nodded his consensus. Outside the window that faced the woods, I saw only the empty yard and the dark tree line, shifting in the breeze. Let's check one more room, and then we get the fuck out of here. The door out of the kitchen opened onto a long hallway. The other end of it was just visible at the edge of my flashlight's beam. My heartbeat pounded in my ears, and I whirled my legs forward with considerable effort. I got to the end of the hallway and stopped. John bumped into me, 
and actually push me further into the room. I leaned back to try and escape from what I was seeing, but it did no good. I felt like my legs were about to give out. Every wall was covered in thick, black writing. Symbols I had never seen before. Symbols that I had seen before. My name. But one word stuck out. Written on the floor. Written on the damn ceiling in that same childlike scrawl. And then I was screaming. And John was screaming. And as I began to voice the word run, I realized that a third voice had joined the cacophony. Her ancient gray face was pressed against the window black eyes darting back and forth as she cackled. Our eyes met, and she was laughing and screaming and foaming at the mouth. Oh, God. Martin. He's coming. Martin is coming. And she was sobbing and laughing and screaming. Oh, God help us. And her face was twisted in glee and agony as she smashed it through the window and kept screaming as the blood began to flow. Martin is here! He's here! And my legs were moving, and the breath left my lungs in gasps and spurts as I followed John back through the kitchen door and into the yard, and, oh God, why was it so bright out here in the middle of the night? We ran down the drive and into the woods, and we ran until we couldn't run any more. And then we ran some more. John, shaking me. The sun was shining. A truck. A truck was coming. Got to get up. The fog lifted a bit, and I saw John running towards the road with his arms out. The kid looked seventeen at most. I heard him say he had a room, and I stumbled out of the culvert in which I had apparently been lying. The clock on the dash said seven, twelve. When the police got there, the house was on fire, and had already burned most of the way down. When John and I recounted the story, they reacted with visible skepticism. I can't blame them, really. Nothing unusual at the scene. Definitely no bodies. I still don't know who that old lady was. Or Martin, for that matter. They told us that the house had been abandoned for as long as they could remember. We're both fine, for the most part. All that is to say is, be careful when using Airbnb. Most of the ones that have a few decent reviews are probably safe, but... Well, two very different stories for you there this evening. Um, kind of different, but thematically it seemed to work, well, in my mind at least, so hope you kind of uh, enjoyed those two about everyday occurrences Going a bit la really, 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 bit wrong. Well, long shift for this uh, start of the week. Back again, probably on Wednesday. Maybe tomorrow, who knows? I don't know, see how I feel. <laughs> of course, Patreon coming up as well. Let's do an end of the month special over on Patreon. So if you feel like supporting me, that'd be lovely. All right, till the next time, my dear friends. Hope you're having a lovely week. The days are getting longer, the night's shorter. Weather's going to be turning soon. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, anyway. So, my dear friends, till the next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud, 
Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.